I'll say it's two o'clock, so we should start now. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who have joined in. I am Shatanik from the biomechanics section in KU Leuven, and I will be the host for today's BPHI keynote webinar given by Professor Gerard Atation from Columbia University in New York. Professor Atation's research is primarily focused in soft tissue mechanics, predominantly cartilage mechanics, uh, cartilage lubrication, and tissue engineering. Not only has he made advances in, theory, in the theoretical field of cartilage mechanics, but also he has collaborated actively in developing an open source platform, the FE Bio, uh, which for, for others to, to be using those theoretical models. So today, Professor Atesian would be talking about tissue engineering of uh, articular surface sized cartilage constructs using experimental and computational optimization. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Gerard Atesian, and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Shadanik. That's a very nice uh, introduction. I want to uh, thank you and the other organizers uh, for inviting me, uh, including Elizabeth Garris. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about the work that we've been doing in cartilage tissue engineering. And uh, I'm going to present the work that uh, two of my a recently graduated PhD students, uh, Robert Nims and Alexander Siegen, did. Uh, the work that I've done in cartilage tissue engineering has been in collaboration with Clark Hong. Gordana Vunyak Novakovic is at Columbia. She's a collaborator of us. She's very well known as the person who pioneered a cartilage tissue engineering starting in the 1980s. She collaborated on us on several of these projects as well. So I'm going to go over the research that we did in tissue engineering. Um, not necessarily in chronological order, but sometimes in thematic order. So I'm going to take you through our discovery process of how to grow functional tissue constructs, meaning tissue cartilage tissue constructs that have mechanical properties that would allow them to sustain the loads in the joints, um, and to make them large enough to replace an art entire articular surface. So. Um, First, let me just uh, make sure that we are all on the same page and review what cartilage is. So this is a knee joint. Uh, this is the femur, distal femur. This is the patella that's been reflected down. This is what the knee joint normally looks like on an MRI. This is the patella, which is your kneecap. And it slides up and down the femur. And here's the tibia in the center. So healthy cartilage is white. It's relatively thick. Its uh, thickness can vary from two to seven millimeters in some places. But with uh, degeneration, you know, the cartilage erodes away, it's a wear mechanism, uh, and it can actually go down to the point where there's no cartilage left and what you see is exposed. So when you start having cartilage worn over the entire surface like this, orthopedic surgeons have uh, basically the only option that they have at this point is to replace the entire joint with a, an implant, an artificial implant in, in a process called arthroplasty. And so you use metal and plastic as replacement. So cartilage tissue engineering has been offered as a potential alternative, maybe as an interim solution before you get to an implant, because the implants have a finite lifetime of about 20 years. Um, so perhaps we can grow cartilage and replace the entire articular surface. So even though this cartilage here looks much better than the cartilage that's worn away here, the fact is that this cartilage is much softer, much more arthritic. So it makes sense to try to replace a much larger surface area. So when you grow cartilage, you need to understand the structure function relationships. You need to understand how cartilage develops its material properties that will allow it to sustain the loads in the joint. So you need to know what is cartilage made of. It contains type two collagen, which is oriented in different directions from the articular surface to the bone. It contains in, inside these collagen, this collagen matrix, there are these large macromolecules that are called proteoglycans, which consist primarily of hyaluronic acid long chains and glycosaminoglycan side chains. So we abbreviate these as GAGs, and the proteoglycans are abbreviated as PGs or PG aggregates. And this composition, plus of course water content, which varies from 60 to almost 90% near the articular surface, these, this composition gives unique mechanical properties to the tissue. The tissue is anisotropic. Its properties depend on the direction of loading. It's nonlinear. The more you load it, the stiffer it becomes. 
It's inhomogeneous. The properties near the articular surface are rather different from the properties near the deep center. So when we do cartilage tissue engineering, we ask ourselves which of these various uh, characteristics are most important to reproduce in our tissue constructs. Here's um, a half of a human knee joint. This is again the patella, this is the femur, and the, the, the thigh would be on the right and the, the, the shank, you know, the, the tibia would be on the left. And even though we describe cartilage as a soft tissue, it's actually relatively stiff, stiff soft tissue. So this is not, it's not as soft as, our, as, as skin, for example. So we are subjecting this half joint to a full body weight. So the full joint would be subjected to two body weights, and that's how much deformation that we see. The speckle pattern that you see, we're using our experiments to get the strain fields, but I'm not gonna talk about that. I just wanted to explain to you that when we grow cartilage, in the lab in order to replace the native arthritic tissue, we need a cartilage that's as strong as this tissue that you see here, which is actually a very big challenge. So when we started our tissue engineering studies with uh, Rob Mock, uh, who was a PhD student in our lab, in 2000, we published this first study from our lab. So we were relatively late comers, as I said, Gordana had been doing cartilage tissue engineering starting from the 1980s. So, um, we started with agarose as our hydrogel, seeded with chondrocytes, and this very first study, we had 10 million cells per ml, and we said from the outset that it's important to dynamically load the constructs to promote this lateral expansion because collagen really resists tension, not compression. So when you compress the tissue construct, if you want the cells to promote tensile properties and grow more collagen, we surmise that we should use a bioreactor that loads these um, these hydrogels. So we compressed them by a relatively small amount, 10% compression. We used an eccentric cam to run this at frequencies from either static loading or up to three hertz. So we could do these and we cultured these explants for four weeks. On day zero, the agarose with the chondrocytes in it, before it grew any matrix, was five kilopascal in compressive modulus. We call this the equilibrium modulus after the fluid pressure has subsided. And by day 28, it went up to about 20 kilopascal. This is the day zero construct, and it became more opaque. By any standards, you would con consider this to be a highly successful outcome. We made the tissue stiffer by a factor of four, 20 kilopascal versus five kilopascal. But when we dynamically loaded it, we had a modulus of 100 kilopascal. So a five-fold increase, or 20-fold rather, increase from five to 100. And the sample, you know, looked a little bit more opaque. So this was our very first study in cartilage tissue engineering. It's also the most cited study. If this study had not been so successful, Clark and I would probably have abandoned the field of cartilage tissue engineering, but we got really excited. And we did a number of studies after this, which I'm not gonna show you. I'm gonna jump into a study we did four years later, where we got ambitious and we said, look, making small constructs whose diameter is about six millimeters is not gonna be useful for clinicians. Really, we should look to replace the entire articular surface. So using computer-aided design, we took MRI and we actually created molds to cast a patella-shaped articular layer on a CNC machine trabecular bone substrate. This is bovine bone that we cut on a milling machine in the machine shop, we sterilized it, we poured the agros, and we grew this in these urine sample cups. And we used the same culture conditions that we had used in those small six millimeter diameter constructs. And what we discovered is, this is just a regular you know, cross section. You can see opacity near the surface here, but this is still quite translucent after 28 days. When you do a stain, a saffron and O stain for the glycosaminoglycans, those proteoglycans, which are an essential compositional element of the tissue, we saw that they got deposited to, uh, near the surface closest to where the sample was exposed to the media, but deeper inside, clearly the tissue uh, did not grow. And in fact, we had the modulus as low as 10 kilopascal, even in the, the stiffest regions. This was quite disappointing. But what was surprising is this patella is the natural size of the tissue. So how is it that the nutrients are not able to reach deep inside? Why, how is it that the native tissue is not able to get its nutrients the normal way? After all, we replicated the native dimensions. So 
it's one of those things that you kind of don't realize, but when we went back to the literature, the anatomy literature, not the cartilage literature, not the orthopedics literature, this was an anatomy journal, we came to the realization that cartilage is actually vascularized up to the age of 16 in humans. By the time the growth plate closes in humans, that's when these cartilage canals, that's what they're called, this vasculature that you see, they close at the age of 16. So during uh, fetal development and during childhood, we actually have a humongous amount of nutrient supply through the blood that pervades throughout the articular layer. This was kind of a bit of a discovery, even though it was in the literature for a long time, and even though when we actually harvest immature bovine cartilage, we can see those canals, we didn't realize that that was the way that the tissue got its nutrients during the critical phase of development. So we decided that for cartilage tissue engineering, we should really provide nutrients in the form of canals or channels, something that we could re reproduce relatively simply. So we decided to then, you know, grow large constructs with channels and we needed to figure out, you know, the amount of stirring in the bath. And we normally grow our constructs uh, by letting them sit at the bottom of a Petri dish. And this is the media. And what we noticed is that, you know, if you put channels in this way, the construct still grows in a weird way. Whether you put channels or you don't put channels, you get the center here is less opaque than the periphery. And it doesn't uh, really come up to a surprise if the channels are blocked at the bottom of the dish, then, you know, the nutrients are not going to reach at the bottom of the fits. But nevertheless, we asked ourselves, could we grow large constructs by, by coring these types of channels in them? And this is where we wanted to um, figure out the answer to this question using simulations, because growing tissues in the lab is actually not trivial especially back in those days when we were still developing our protocols, half of the time there would be some kind of infection in our tissue constructs or, you know, the, uh, the slaughterhouse that delivers the joints from which we harvest the cartilage and get the cells would not have joints available that week. So it seemed to make sense to use in silico simulations to try to optimize the growth conditions, figure out, you know, whether channels would be helpful or not. So we decided to use mixture theory, which is the framework, a theoretical framework developed relatively recently in the history of mechanics. And we decided to include in the model a mixture of a solid matrix, which consists of the agarose hydrogel. And over time, as you deposit, as the cells deposit proteoglycans and collagen, those would be separate, you know, um, if you want, constituents of the solid matrix. We would include the interstitial fluid to allow the transport of nutrients in the form of solutes, sodium chloride ions, nutrients, maybe glucose, and the matrix products that are synthesized by the cells that get released and then bind to the matrix. So we wanted to incorporate chemical reactions in our model to let the cells synthesize the building blocks of proteoglycans and collagen in response to the availability of nutrients and also allow for these synthesized products to be released from the cells, bind to the matrix. So we needed to put reactions into our model. So these computational models immediately became extremely complex. So we needed a framework. We decided that whatever we developed, we should also be able to share it with the general uh, you know, community of biomechanics and tissue engineering researchers. So we shared it in this FEBio software, which was co-developed by Jeff Weiss and Steve Moss at the University of Utah. Here's a simulation, let me go through you know, this is a disc shown only in the cross section. So it's an axisymmetric analysis. This is the center line of the disc. And what I'm going to show you is a mixture. So the disc is in a bath. The bath itself is not modeled explicitly. We're just applying boundary conditions for the nutrients. So the mixture itself contains agarose modeled as an alkene solid. It also contains chondroitin sulfate as the sub as the component of the glycosaminoglycans, which uh, gives negative fixed charge to the tissue. And then we're gonna have in the fluid, the solvent, which is water, we're gonna have glucose as a nutrient, sodium chloride, magnesium and sulfate, because we need the magnesium sulfate to produce chondroitin sulfate as the result of a reaction where the cells take the magnesium sulfate and synthesize GAGs. The reactions are glucose consumption by cells just for homeostasis and glucose consumption for chondroitin sulfate synthesis 
that consumes, you know, glucose and the sulfate from the magnesium sulfate. Then the matrix that's being produced contains proteoglycans, which are negatively charged. This is the charge density. The charge density, which because they're fixed, they will attract ions from the external bath, and then the ions that will flow in, will there will be more positive ions than negative ions that flow in. So the net concentration of ions inside will actually be uh, different than the concentration outside. So water will go in to equalize the osmolarity inside and outside, which will cause the construct to swell. And that will seem like it's growing, not it seems like, it is the form of growth. So now I'm gonna run the simulation. Um, and I think I need to exit the slide mode. Uh, I'm gonna run the simulation and you're gonna see, initially there's a bit of an osmotic shrinking, but over time the glucose is available at the edges. And so there will be preferential deposition of the proteoglycans at the edges and the cells inside get less glucose. So by the time we're done, there's more proteoglycans where there were more nutrients. You know, as the glucose is enter, entering, it gets consumed. So there's less and less glucose available for the cells deep inside. So this is the shape predicted in the growth model from Methibio. And what's interesting is it's similar to the shape that we actually got. This is the agarose construct at day zero. So that would be this shape here. And this, you know, shape that you see would be equivalent to that. And that's the shape of the construct. So we were happy to see that the simulations with FE Bio at least qualitatively agree with the shape that we were getting. We hadn't yet simulated the role of channels. In order to have the channels be effective, we needed to figure out a way to make the media flow through the channels. So we decided to span our tissue constructs that had channels. In this case, they only had three channels. We stood them up in these racks and we put them on an orbital shaker or on a rocker. We were curious to know which one would give better transport of nutrients through without having to run a computational fluid dynamics analysis. So these are the results of the static result. If there was no orbital shaking, no rocking, this is the compressive modulus after 56 days in culture. If you don't have channels, zero channels, you get less growth than if you add the channels. Even three channels are enough. Remember, there's no dynamic loading here. We're still able to reach now 100 kilopascals after 56 days, just by you know um, allowing the channels to be there. So even though the channels are blocked at the bottom, if you put them in the rocker, something goes wrong. We don't know what, we couldn't figure it out. But if you put them in the orbital shaker, the results are very good. Both the construct without channels gets more nutrients and the construct with channel grows even more, and this is statistically significantly different. So we decided that from this point on, we would use a rocker and not, I'm sorry, we would use an orbital shaker and not a rocker. We didn't explore the reason why the rocker didn't work. It's an interesting, but not important question. It's fun to explore, but it's irrelevant in our goal to grow large tissue constructs. With in, we are engineers, we, we have a goal in mind, it is the goal to grow articular constructs that have the size of an articular leg. So then we needed to figure out, okay, if we're gonna put channels, how far apart should the channels be? We decided that we're gonna do this hexagonal pattern. So we could do, when we do a simulation on FE Bio, we could run the simulation by using planes of symmetry, but we needed to develop a fine element code for these elemental volumes but we needed to know what are the critical nutrients? Is it glucose? Is it something else? And also, how much you know, do the cells produce matrix products based on the amount of nutrients that they get? And do we need to worry about the uh, matrix products being released into the media or do they actually bind to the matrix quickly? Do we lose most of the collagen and proteoglycan that's synthesized by the cells or do we retain most of it? We wanted to predict these outcomes computationally and then validate them against experiments. So we needed to run a bunch of experiments to figure out what's the critical nutrient and you know, what's the synthesis rate of the chondrocytes in the presence of those nutrients. So we ran these experiments using what we call chemically defined culture media. The very first study I showed you in 2000, we were using fetal bovine serum, but we quickly discovered like many other researchers in the field of tissue engineering, fetal bovine serum varies from batch to batch. You don't know what is in the natural fetal bovine serum. Some batches gave great growth, others didn't. 
So we decided we have to move away from that. We moved to chemically defined media containing ITS, insulin, transferrin, and selenous acid. We also had high glucose DMEM, ascorbate, which is vitamin C, and we had already shown that if we add TGF beta, but only for the first two weeks in culture, we get the best results in terms of gag deposition and the compressive stiffness. So now we needed to take the standard media that we used and selectively deplete or change the concentration of insulin. So either have no insulin or 30% of the normal amount or one times 100% or threefold, tenfold, thirtyfold. We did the same with transferrin, salinous acid, with uh, the, the vitamin C and with the glucose. And here's what we found. With a transferrin and salinous acid, it made no difference whether you added it or you didn't add it. The concentration made no difference. We still got the same modulus after 56 days in culture. With insulin, it was an on-off thing. Either you don't have it, in which case you don't grow anything, or you had even 30% is enough, which suggested that insulin is critical for growth, but not dose-dependent effect, whereas transferrin is not critical for growth, salinous acid not critical for growth. Vitamin C, kind of similar. If you take it away completely, it's catastrophic, but if you have only 30%, it's fine. Of course, if you have too much, if you have 30-fold, then you start getting worse results. But still, as long as you have vitamin C and you don't uh, you know, consume it, it's fine. Glucose, however, seemed to have a consumption effect, meaning like if you only put 30% of glucose, you didn't have enough glucose to grow this. And whereas if you had one times or three times, if you had too much, then it, you were fine. So we decided that the most critical nutrient was glucose because it showed a dose-dependent effect. So we needed to explore this more closely. So we repeated this study on small constructs, four millimeter diameter, no channels, 2.3 millimeters thick, 18 million cells per ml. And what we did is we placed, we actually placed them in either 17% of normal glucose concentration, 50%, two thirds, you know, four fifths or, you know, full amount. We looked at the amount of glucose that was left in the media after, every time we replenished. We replenished the media Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So from Friday to Monday is three days. So after three days, we would sample the media and we would see that starting from in early on in the days in culture, this is up to 42 days in culture, from early on there was very little glucose left if we only put 17%. If we put more, you could see that there was more, more glucose left. And if you put the 100%, 25 millimolar concentration, you had plenty of glucose left. So we could figure out the amount of glucose consumption in each case, and we saw that at 17%, that's how much was consumed. If you had 50%, this is how much was consumed. So we looked at the Young's modulus once again. At 17%, it was much lower than at 50%. And the same with, um, uh, so Young's modulus and the GAG content. So we concluded, that there is that 50% threshold, which if you normally use 25 millimolar, millimolar of glucose, then 50% is 12.5 millimolar. That would be the threshold below which we start getting poor properties. So if you start out with 1x glucose and you drop to 12.5 millimolar, you're fine. If you drop below 12.5 millimolar, then you get poor growth. So that was the critical, um, if you want, uh, nutrient that we identified in our simulations. So now we're gonna run our simulations. Here is our simulation. We're gonna have a finite bath, which is five milliliters of uh, bath per construct. And we're going to look at the concentration of glucose starting out at 25 millimolar in the bath and how much is left. We're gonna make sure that the bath is well stirred because it's sitting on the orbital shaker. So the concentration of glucose will remain uniform in the bath. We're gonna see the cells consuming the uh, glucose in the bath. And when it drops below 12.5 millimolar, we're gonna say we're unhappy. I'm gonna run this first simulation here. And what you see is the concentration in the bath goes down. And this is at 36 hours, so one and a half days. There's already very little concentration. We dropped below the, the threshold already in the construct that doesn't have a channel. Then I'm gonna show you more results, but not by running the simulation. If I have a channel, it turns out that even after one and a half days, I'm, I've consumed too much glucose, nothing is left. And if I wait for three days from Friday to Monday, 
it's catastrophic. I've actually consumed all of the glucose. If I use a construct that's larger, you know, a 10 millimeter diameter construct. So we concluded that five milliliters of media per construct is not enough. So we simulated 10 milliliters and 15 milliliters, and I'm showing you now the results for 15 milliliters. After three days, that's just enough to leave a little bit of glucose in the sample at the end of three days. So from these computer simulations, we concluded that the amount of media that we were using in the past uh, in terms of glucose content was not enough. And you may say, okay, so what do other people use? It turns out there's no standard in the literature for the amount of media per construct volume. So we research the literature and some people use less than five ml, some people use more. So whatever we were using was not enough. So we needed to see whether experimentally we could confirm that increasing from five ml to 15 ml would produce better results and having channels versus having no channels would produce uh, you know, better reasons. So we needed to run those experiments. So we needed to come up with a way to grow the, to, to cast these agarose constructs in an easy way with channels instead of pouring out the channels individually with a core punch. We came out with this method that had pegs. So this would be for the one with the three millimeter, uh, three channels per 10 millimeter diameter construct. This one would have 12 channels. So we cast these. And with three channels, 12 channels for 10 millimeter diameter or zero channels. And we cultured them. So these particular ones have 100 million cells per annual, which is a pretty large, 10 times higher than the earlier study that we did in 2000. And this is the result at day 56 for 12 channels per construct. You can see that with the channels, the sample grows a lot more than without the channels. So already we're discovering that there's a considerable amount of swelling that takes place when you have the channel. So if we consider the swelling ratio to be the, the weight at, the, at day 56 divided by the wet weight at day zero, you can see that we have a threefold increase in the volume or the weight, right, in the constructs with channels. So this was an important discovery. So obviously having more channels gives you better growth and having more media gives you better results than having less media. So qualitatively, these agreed with our simulations. More channels is better, and more media volume per construct is better. Although these results don't show as big of an effect of the media volume as the computer simulations show. I'll come back to this point later in my talk, assuming that I have enough time. <laughs> I have so much to present. Anyway, so the other thing is, normally when you look at the collagen content and the gag content, you usually normalize it by the wet weight, at the final day in culture. But the wet weight is so much larger in the constructs that swell, right, in the one with the channels, that it's not enough to normalize by the day 56 wet weight. We should also normalize by the day zero wet weight to see the effect of how much matrix deposition. So if you normalize by day zero, the GAD content is in fact much higher in the constructs with channels. The collagen content is also much higher in the constructs with channels. This is normalized by day zero. So this confirms that having more channels is better and having more media per channel is better. Clearly this result here is much better than this result. So it was great to see that the composition improved considerably when you normalized it properly. So from now on, we decided to use 15 ml per volume of construct. And um, I mean, 15 ml per construct, uh, normalized to the number of cells per construct also, which I'm not going into those details. And we decided to have 12 channels. Okay, but what if you normalize by the final day in culture, by the wet weight in the final day, you actually see no difference. So if we had only normalized by day 56, which is the normal way you would do it, we would have concluded that no, it makes no difference whether you have more media or more channels, you still have the same amount of gag, you still have the same amount of collagen. Young's modulus, remember, it's already normalized by the area of the sample. So there's no, it's not the same thing as normalizing by, you always normalize it by the area of the sample in the current configuration. You don't normalize it by the day zero. So this is how we report Young's modulus. So Young's modulus is about the same no matter which condition, collagen content about the same, GAG content about the same. So that's why normalizing by the final day wet weight is not enough. You have to do both normalizations to see the effect. I want to say one more thing. 
is that the GAG content that you see here has reached the native levels, but the collagen content for the bovine tissue from which we get those cells, the collagen content is usually 10 to 12 percent of the tissue at weight. So we only have 1.5 percent. So the collagen content is way below the native level, whereas the GAG content is slightly above. Normally for these tissues, 4 to 5 percent GAG content is the native level. Okay. So then we asked ourselves, can we increase the collagen content? Because we know that it's important to have that tensile stiffness for cartilage so that when you compress it, it resists the lateral expansion. So we said, well, if we add even more cells per ml, maybe we can produce more collagen. The problem is, what's the normal concentration of cells in the tissue? Well, Bob Saab published an abstract which he showed that for immature cartilage, so juvenile cartilage is closer to 150 million cells per ml. For, um, for fetal cartilage, it could be as high as 300 million cells per ml. But the students in my lab told me that if they cast any more than 120 million cells per ml, the slurry that they create is too viscous to pour through the pipette into the constructs to create the constructs. So the maximum concentration we could use is 120, which was already pretty large. But we did this study on small constructs, three millimeter diameter. This is the GAG content up to 105 days in culture. This is a very long time, but we were curious. Look what happens. The native level of GAG, if you normalize it by you know, the uh, tissue wet weight, is normally in this range. Already after two weeks in culture, we exceed by having so many cells. The cells are producing far more GAG than we want. But if you look at the collagen, remember that usually by day 56, we don't have enough. Remember, this is 120 million cells per ml, so by day 56, we're pretty high here. And by, if we wait long enough, we're finally able to get to the native level. So you might think, wow, this is fantastic. All we have to do is use higher cell seeding density, and then we can get the collagen level that we want. Ah, it's okay if we have too much glycan. It's too much of a good thing. Well, it turns out too much of a good thing is not good. And I'm going to talk about that. So this is what happens. The tissue now, the swelling ratio by day 105 is ninefold. Ninefold increase in volume. This is the construct at day zero, it's three millimeter diameter. This is the construct at day 105. Not only that, but if you actually look at the compressive modulus, it doesn't increase past day 35, it plateaus. It plateaus even though supposedly we're depositing more collagen and more proteic lichens. So this plateauing was bothersome. So we started asking ourselves this question. You have to remember, we're the first people to grow cartilage with so much success. Nobody has seen that much swelling in their tissue constructs. In fact, nobody else before us had seen any swelling in their tissue constructs. Usually the construct fills in with more collagen and gag. It doesn't swell much. But we're seeing ninefold swelling and the modulus is reaching a plateau. So now we're asking ourselves, could it be that because we're putting proteoglycans faster than collagen, the proteoglycans cause the tissue to swell due to this osmotic effect I explained earlier. Maybe the swelling is actually damaging the collagen matrix that's being deposited because this collagen is being deposited at lower rates than the proteoglycan. So we decided to test this hypothesis using simulations. You hypothesize a mechanism, but you don't know if that hypothesis is valid. So we wanted to figure out if, if we follow fundamental concepts of physics, of mechanics, could we validate this hypothesis? So we had to develop a collagen damage model using reactive mixture theory, where we assume that the collagen covalent bonds, which are intact bonds, can break into broken bonds, so we're damaging the collagen by breaking it at the covalent bonds, we had to develop a whole damage framework for that in the con uh, uh, context of uh, mixture theory, but then we had to make sure that this damage framework was consistent with classical damage theories in metal, uh, you know, uh, in metal rich. Anyway, those are small details. So then what we did was we took this model and we fitted it to the data to extract the damage parameters. And we then fitted also the swelling response uh, because, you know, we have a lot of parameters in our analysis. So we also fitted simultaneously the swelling response. So these are the results of the fit. 
The fit is reasonably good. It's not bad at all. Using this fit, now we have the properties of the tissue and how much the collagen got damaged. We were able to hypothesize what if the collagen didn't get damaged. So we turned off the damage in the simulation. When we did that, it actually predicted much less swelling, five-fold swelling instead of nine-fold. But it still swelled. Why? Because we still have a whole lot more gag than we have collagen. And then when we try to predict the compressive modulus, this time, if you don't have damage, you would get what intuitively you might expect, a monotonically increasing modulus. So this was great. We were able to validate the model, um, our, our hypothesis with the model. It made sense to hypothesize that collagen damage was responsible for the plateauing of the uh, Young's modulus. But like everything else, so now we have a uh, a mechanism, a hypothesis that we validated against physical principles, but it would be nice to show how much collagen damage do we have. Now, these studies are done, you know, only a few years ago. Luckily, in 2008, Bank et al. came up with an assay based on alpha-chondotrypsin that allows us to determine how much of the collagen is damaged. So alpha-chondotrypsin is the enzyme in your stomach that digests the food, the proteins that we have chewed. So what you can do is you can take your construct and you digest the collagen with alpha chondotrypsin. Only the damaged collagen will come out. You measure that. And then you measure the rest of the collagen using your standard assay. And so you can see the damage is yellow. The total is the height of the bar graph. The intact is the orange. You can see that even at day 14, a big fraction of the collagen is already damaged. Why? Because the proteoglycans are swelling. So we were able to now confirm from experiments from biochemical assay that in fact, the collagen damage is pretty high. So it's exciting because we were able to explain our results, but it's disappointing because it says that even though you're growing tissue from scratch, even though you're reaching the native level of collagen, you're not making the tissue as good as the native tissue. You're damaging it, why? Because your GAC production is much faster than the collagen production. It's just the nature of the beast. The chondrocytes that you isolate from immature bovine cartilage have this ability to grow GAG much better than collagen, but they haven't lost the ability to grow collagen. If you wait 105 days, you can get all the collagen you want. Unfortunately, you're damaging it, and you can actually show that the total collagen content increases over time, but the amount that's damaged also increases. So unfortunately, we concluded that the standard method of simply increasing the cell seeding density doesn't work. We're growing damaged tissue. Our fresh tissue constructs are not as good as the native tissue. That was disappointing. So what can we do? So we tried sophisticated techniques like the silencing RNA technique. Maybe if we could like shut down the GAC production initially, let the collagen deposit. But siRNA technology is very finicky. It's also very inefficient. And siRNA only reaches the cells when they're plated. It's very difficult to do it in cells that are embedded in the hydrogel. So it didn't work. We tried it. So then we came up with a much more elementary method, a middle-aged torture chamber. We decided to put the constructs inside cages. And we figured if we present, prevent them from swelling, maybe the collagen will not get damaged. We put them in this, after two weeks of culture with TGF beta, the TGF beta binds to the metal and to the polysulfone. So while we're adding TGF beta, we cannot put them in a cage. But after two weeks, we put them in a cage like this. We close the cage with this perforated stainless steel plate. And then we let them culture for a while in those racks. We still have to use the racks to let the nutrients go through. This is a movie of the first time that we took out these samples from, uh, from the petri dish, from the media. And you know, I'm not gonna show you the whole movie. You'll, it'll get abbreviated. You don't have to watch all the screws being unscrewed. We were just curious to see if the samples would pop out and suddenly expand. So far, so good. They're, they seem to be looking good. And then, you know, uh, when, when Alex, who's actually, we were seeing his fingers here, when he popped out the sample, it looked like it maintained its thickness reasonably well. So now we needed to measure the properties and the biochemical you know, content. When we did this, we were surprised to see, this is a preliminary study. We're looking at day 42 
12 channels, 10 millimeter diameter. The cage constructs were actually stiffer. The controls, because they swelled, actually were not as stiff. But what was amazing is the collagen content was equally good. So putting them in a cage did not provide, prevent the nutrients from reaching them. The gag content was equally good. And the swelling in the cage was less. There's a tiny bit of swelling because remember the first two weeks they were not in a cage. And at day 42, the control group swelled, but not a huge amount. Now that we knew that the cages work, we went and we did a more extensive study. And when we went longer, we went to day 56, and we used the higher cell seeding density. This is the control sample. Look how much it expanded. It shows you how much the cage prevented that extraordinary amount of swelling. And you can see here the construct after it's taken out from the cage, it still didn't swell any further. And then when we measured the um, periodontal cross links, what we found is, again, this is at day 14 when both groups have not yet been put in cages. Then these are the three swelling ones. They have a statistically smaller, I'm sorry, I don't have the statistical symbols here. They have less cross links than the ones that were put in cages. So it looks like if you prevent the swelling, you keep the collagen closer to each other. And so you promote more cross linking. And when you measure the Young's modulus, this is the final study, the one that was published. Look at the Young's modulus, it plateaus as we expect in the ones that were not in the cage. But the ones that were in the cage grow beautifully well. Of course, you shouldn't wait up to 112 days, even though these are not statistically different from each other. You can see a downward trend nevertheless. So, so, but by day 56, we're doing great. And this is what we call the dynamic modulus at 0.1 hertz. Also, in the native tissue, it would be 20 megapascal. So we're now at about four, three and a half to four megapascal. So the cage strategy is fantastic. So we're gonna stick with it, unfortunately, um, this case strategy was a side study. Now I'm going to take you back to the main thrust. We had funding to do large constructs. The cages was an explanation of how we could prevent excessive swelling. But with the large constructs, we were not going to put them in cages. So now we have to go back to this question. We've tried already zero channels. We've tried three channels and 12 channels. And of those three, we found that 12 channels is statistically better than three channels for gag content and collagen content when normalized to day zero. So is 12 channels per 10 millimeter diameter construct enough or do we need more channels? So you know that the more channels you have, the more nutrient you provide, so you expect more tissue growth. But the more channels you pour out, the less, the fewer cells are left in your construct. So there comes a point where if you have too many channels, you have no more cells left. So there's some kind of optimal intersection and yes, we could do this using computational analysis. That was the goal of our original grant. We want to use a computational study. But to be honest, when we look at the computational results, these are the computational results for the glucose consumption. They show a very strong effect of the media volume. So if you increase the media volume, you get much better outcomes than if you increase the number of channels. This is 0, 3, 7, and 12 channels. Whereas in the experiments, the effect of media volume was not as strong as the effect of channels. So we're, even though qualitatively we were able to confirm the trends of the model with the experiments, quantitatively, the model suggested that the effect of channel was not as significant as the effect of the media volume, whereas the experiments suggested that the effect of channels was critical. So that meant that something was missing in the model. What was missing in the model? We thought hard about it. And remember, we're running down the clock. Our grant is about to expire. And in order to renew it, we have to show the results. We didn't have time to rerun all these computational simulations. Now, independently, a former student in my lab, who by then was already a postdoc, Mike Albert, he's now a faculty member at Boston University, had discovered that TGF beta binds to the cartilage tissue construct matrix. It binds like crazy. If you put 10 nanogram per ml of TGF beta in the media, but then you assay how much TGF beta has, is in the construct after 72 hours, near the surface of the construct, close to the boundary with the media, you are at 55 nanograms per ml, which means there's binding. Uh, how else could the concentration be higher than in the media? That means it's binding. But if you're a millimeter away, there's very little TGF beta left. So it turns out that the binding of TGF-beta is critical, and he confirmed this from histology. 
These are constructs with TGF beta. Look, there's much higher gag deposition near the surface of the construct. And if you don't have TGF beta, you have a more uniform gag deposition. And this is a close-up accompanied with the biochemical assay. This is as a function of distance. If you don't have TGF beta, you have the uniform, the reasonably uniform gag content. Of course, near the surface, you have some loss into the media, but you have the binding. So we needed to take into account that TGF beta binding was far more influential in our tissue studies than we realized. So we repeated our channel study with and without TGF beta. So if we have no channels or we have channels, if you have TGF beta, you get the swelling that I showed you before. But if you don't add TGF beta, then there's no swelling. And this is the gag content. So we realized that you know, the channels are helping not just because of the glucose. Obviously, they help with the glucose transport, but they were helping because you have TGF beta binding in a ring that's about a millimeter in radius around each channel. So that was a realization that occurred late in our, you know, grant period. So we needed now to simulate, to find the optimal number of channels. We decided, let's just do it experimentally. We had already done zero and three channels and 12 channels. So we repeated it with 12, 19, and 27 channels per 10 millimeter construct. At 27 channels, you can see there's much less room for cells. And these constructs are very delicate. They break apart very easily. So do those. They all grew, but the ones with 12 and 19 channels gave higher gag content than the one with 27. Again, I don't have the symbols for statistical significance, unfortunately, on this graph but this was statistically less. So since 12 and 19 channels gave the same results and we had plenty of experience with 12 millimeter, with 12 channels for 10 millimeter construct, these were too delicate. We decided from this point on, we're going to stick with 12 channels per 10 millimeter construct, which means whatever spacing we have here in a 10 millimeter construct, we're going to use that spacing between the channels for the larger constructs. So then we're ready to make much larger constructs the size of a human patella and we're going to put them in media which is equivalent to 15 ml per volume of construct when the construct was only six millimeter diameter so we need a huge amount of media if we use tgf beta at 10 nanogram per ml it's going to cost a lot of money so the students decided let's try one nanogram per ml instead of 10 nanogram per ml and the results looked equally good for the gag and the collagen there was no statistical difference this is the histology. You can see these are the channels, and where there are no channels, the gag deposition is quite uniform. Fantastic. So we save money, we use one nanogram per ml. Now we're going to make constructs which are 40 millimeters in diameter and 2.3 millimeters thick. We're now using 3D printing, which is pervasively available by this time. And you can see the channels, the pillars here are going to be used for casting the channels. This is a blank agarose construct. Um, and we're going to put them in racks and we're going to stand them up in the racks and put them on the orbital shaker. So we did all of this. Now you can imagine how many joints do you need to harvest every week in order to make each one of these constructs. So we could only culture two constructs every time we harvested cells. So we started with the preliminary study. These are the results of our preliminary study. We have this construct and you're seeing the channels, and what you're discovering is the channels actually filled in after culture. They filled in, which means at some point, the nutrients were no longer reaching the inside of the construct. And sure enough, when you look at the histology, this is the center line of the construct, you can see a lot of gag deposition on the outside, nice and crispy on the outside, nice and chewy on the inside. So uh, we call this the m, &M effect, or Smarties maybe in Europe, you eat Smarties. So it's crunchy on the outside, soft on the inside. And this is the collagen stain. So I told the students, since we're doing this every two weeks, we're starting a new cast, why don't you repunch them? So he went and manually, one by one, repunched the channels. Here he had repunched them only once. Then he repunched them twice. And then this is construct five with three channels uh, per construct, three channel equivalent. This is 12 channel equivalent. If we had 10 millimeter diameter, that would be the distance between the channels. And if we had the 12 channel equivalent, we had much better matrix deposition than if we had three channels per construct. And we needed to repunch them. So this is now repunched at weeks three and five. This is the final study. Again, this is the agarose blank 
And I told the student to put it in media so it looks like an actual construct at day zero, but this doesn't even have cells in it. Look at how fragile it is. If you add cells, it's even more fragile. So I told the student on purpose to break it apart. And this is the construct after it came out at day 56, after it's been repunched at weeks three and five. And I told the student, don't bend it too much unless it breaks before we test it. So, <laughs> but it looks fantastic. We were so happy. Here's the picture again. Now this is, um, you know, this is with the primary cells and the students kept telling me, if we're gonna do this with human cells, we're gonna need to do passage cells. So this is with passage cells. So this is the 40 millimeter construct. This is the 10 millimeter control with 12 channels. This is a four millimeter diameter control without channels. And here's a picture of the construct next to a human patella, human tibial plateau from one of those human knees that we have. You can see, obviously, we're creating the, the requisite size to replace an entire articular surface. Look at the histology. The four millimeter construct shows a small region on the inside where the nutrients didn't reach. The 10 millimeter construct is okay with the primary cells. With the passive cells, even the 10 millimeter construct is not getting enough nutrients at the center. But the 40 millimeter construct mostly is fine. Uh, there are some regions where there's no matrix deposition, but in general, the results are quite good. When you actually measure Young's modulus, you find that Young's modulus for the 40 millimeter construct is even better than the other two controls, but all of them lie in the range of the native tissue, including the one with the passive cells. GAD content, again, on the high side. Collagen content, much better than the 1.6% we were getting earlier. We're almost reaching 4% in some cases, but still below the 10 to 12% of the native level. But still, these were very exciting results. No one had grown cartilage constructs so big with such good properties. And what we showed is that scaling it up in size didn't make things worse. In fact, it made them slightly better. Now we had so much tissue left after we're doing the mechanical testing, we could also do friction measurements this is the equilibrium friction coefficient after you wait long enough. It's comparable to the native cartilage. That was very nice and exciting. Anyway, and so now you might ask, so what happens to these channels? You know, do you want to leave them there? The answer is no, because they actually are sites of stress concentration when you load. You could have cracks that deposit there. So either you would let them fill in by not repunching the constructs after the fifth week in culture, you don't repunch them. You just let them grow for two more weeks and then they fill in. Or you keep the channels open while the construct is sitting on a shelf because Arthrex has this cardiform product that they use, which is native cartilage scaffold, I mean, the collagen scaffold that they receive with cells. Anyway, the point is they, they have to put channels to let the cells survive while they maintain the allograft in culture. So it could be something similar. So that's the main result that I wanted to show you. Now you may ask, all of this was done with bovine chondrocytes. Can you get similar results with human chondrocytes? The answer is yes. Preliminarily, we harvested human tissue from human allografts that the tissue banks were discarding. After four weeks on the shelf, if that allograft was not requested by a surgeon, they would donate it to us. We were able to get five donors. These are the age ranges. I, I don't want to spend too much time because I'm running down the clock. We did only three millimeter diameter constructs. We had variable cell seeding densities, but we, we binned them into 30 million cells per ml, 60 million cells per ml. 60 million cells, this is the gag deposition. It's much more opaque than 30 million cells per ml. Sure enough, Young's modulus is much better with 60 million cells per ml. But the modulus reaches a peak, and then technically these are not statistically lower, but you can see a downward transfer. There's a plateau in the Young's modulus that we don't see with the bovine. There's a plateau in the GAG content that we don't see in the bovine. The bovine would keep growing over time. But still, these are in the native level, so that was very encouraging. And in one particular donor, we were able to compare 40 million cells per ml to 90 million cells per ml. Definitely the higher cell seeding density is better. So all of these results suggest that the human tissue, uh, you know, we could use a lot of these things that we develop with the bovine cells, with the human cells, but we have to realize that there's less gag retention with human cells than with the bovine. I didn't show you the results with the bovine. We retain 85%, no matter how many days in culture, but with the human, the retention rate goes down. So we would have to research those uh, in greater detail in the future. I'm gonna skip the conclusions. I'll leave them up on this 
and I'm going to open the floor to questions because I think I have only six minutes left. Okay, thank you, Shatani. You can take over. Uh, thank you, Professor Atation, for this very interesting talk. It was really fascinating to see how experiments and numerical modeling was complemented to achieve the final goal of growing tissues. So I would like to open the floor for questions. So for the attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat box and I will read them to Professor Atation for answering. At the moment, I haven't seen any questions, so I will start off the, the discussion with a using my privileges as a moderator to ask the first question. So my first question is Professor Tation, that the whole volume of work that you showed, uh, it was without using any mechanical stimulus other than the orbital shaking for the nutrients. So was there any specific reason that you decided to leave out the mechanical stimulus given the fact that the cartilage or the, the, the tissue engineered cartilage would finally be implanted in vivo and they would be subjected to a mechanical stimulus in the long run? Yes. So that's a good, good question. So when we did the very st first study in the year 2000, we showed that if you dynamically load the constructs, you get much better results. However, the static control was just that, it was static. There was no stirring of the media. It didn't occur to us back then because it was gonna be very hard to do the stirring. Um, it didn't occur to us that the stirring would be important. That was one thing. And after four days, four weeks in culture with 10 million cells per ml, we got 100 kilopascal, which was nice, but it wasn't in the native level. Then later, when uh, Rob Mock, and during his postdoc, discovered that taking away the TGF beta after two weeks gives you better properties, it turned out that suddenly we were getting much better than 100 kilopascals just by stopping the TGF beta after two weeks. So when you do the mechanical testing of constructs, the experiment is not trivial. There are the constructs, while you dynamically load them, sometimes they will move around. Sometimes as they move around, they come together, they stick to each other. By the time you finish four weeks in culture, they're stuck together, you would have to cut them apart. Sometimes they would crack. They would end up at the edge of the platen and they would be only partially loaded. So actually the mechanical stimulation was not a trivial thing to do. It was a, a bit of a thing. And so when we realized that stirring the media and you taking away the TGF beta after two weeks gave you properties just as good, we decided that the mechanical loading, perhaps we could reuse it at the very end when we're done, figuring out all the other parameters, then we could go back and flip the dynamic. Oh, and the final answer is we were not able to renew that grant, unfortunately. The reviewers decided that when we, when we proposed to then take these constructs and put them in dogs, we said we're ready now to do the animal study. They said, what's new? You already showed us that putting channels, you know, and doing everything that you did works. So they were not excited by <laughs> simply doing it in an animal study. So we were not able to renew that grant. So that's the, the sad outcome of that particular study. So those those uh, you know, studies have come to an end. So we, we, I, we haven't gotten to the point where we could try the dynamic loading or the cages or the large constructs in animal models, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you for, for that insightful answer. Uh, we have a question from uh, Robert Funnel, and he asks, uh, what determines the channel size that you use for your construct? Can you so, use smaller channels to leave more space for the cells? Um, so originally when we wrote the grant, we said we would try different channel diameters. Uh, we ended up using one millimeter diameter because there are core punches, corneal core punches that come in that size. And uh, we found out that they were filling in anyway. And so if we made them smaller, they would fill in faster. Since it was a lot of pain for the student to go back and recore each channel, in the large constructs at week three and week five, we decided to stick with one millimeter diameter, not smaller. So it was a practical decision. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we have another question from Mohammed Pashenari, and he says, uh, uh, he congratulates you on the beautiful presentation, and then he says that, uh, speaking of normalizing the GAC content, uh, wouldn't it have been more accurate to divide it by dry weight instead of wet weight? Uh, so you can always do that as well. Uh, it's not a question of more accurate. It's just different ways of normalizing. So when you normalize by dry weight, it's usually to figure out 
how much protein lichen you have relative to collagen. But you can figure it out if you're also normalizing it by wet weight, since they're both normalized by the same number. So you could compare those numbers and figure it out. So it's just a preference. Historically, in our lab, we've normalized by wet weight. That's all. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so for the other attendees, uh, if you have any more questions, please uh, feel free to ask them in the chat box or in the question box. And I already have another one from Sayed Ali Elahi. Uh, and he says that, he asks, is there any relation between construct mechanical properties like stiffness and porosity and tissue growth? So uh, there's always like a weak correlation between the composition, especially the gag content correlates reasonably well with the compressive modules. Uh, and that makes sense from principles of mechanics. In terms of the collagen content, we never found a strong significance. And now that we understand that the collagen can get damaged, so just because you have collagen there and the assay is telling you you have collagen, it doesn't mean that that collagen has structural integrity. So we don't find a strong correlation with the collagen content. Uh, in terms of the porosity, uh, it's ultimately if you normalize by the wet weight, you're taking into account the porosity. So, so we don't uh, historically in the cartilage literature, not the cartilage tissue engineering literature, correlations against water content have not been terribly strong only because the water content varies very little over time uh, or at different locations. So. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question from Kerem, and he asks, uh, how close are you to building an isotropic constructs where collagens are aligned just as in the superficial zone, as you would see in articular cartilage? So uh, we're not close at all. <laughs> at the beginning of my talk, um, I kind of said, you know, of the various characteristics of native articular cartilage, what would be the most important characteristics to replicate in our tissue constructs? And this is where having, uh, having uh, mechanics models of the cartilage are helpful. So when we do mechanics models of cartilage, we can put random orientation of collagen throughout the thickness of the tissue construct, like we expect it to be in our cartilage tissue constructs, or we can put the native alignment, which means parallel to the articular surface in the superficial zone, more random in the middle zone, and perpendicular to the articular surface in the region. When we do this, we find that the functional benefits of the orientation are, are the same, meaning like if the collagen is randomly oriented, then uh, the, those collagens which are tangential to the articular surface are going to play the role of this native superficial zone. So it's not absolutely critical to replicate that zonal structure as a first attempt as you grow the tissue, especially that we don't have a simple way to do it. I mean, we don't know how we can force the cells to deposit the collagen in the way that it does in the native tissue. So um, we think that first we should get the collagen content to reach the native level in a shorter culture period. Next, we got to make sure that the collagen doesn't get damaged. After that, if we still find that we're not able to replicate the native mechanical properties and frictional properties, then we would focus on the organization of the collagen. But it, it's premature. It's too hard to do. And so that's why I'm saying we're not close to it. We don't know that it's that important. Okay. Uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, that was uh, quite insightful uh, in, in terms of the orientation because there, there's always this debate about using these electrospun scaffolds, whether you can allow cells to deposit uh, collagen fibrils in, in a particular direction so as to have that. But as you mentioned, if it is not well established as to the whether that orientation would help us in the long run, so it's, it's probably something for, for later development. And also, um, usually, you, if you use a fibrous scaffold, maybe you can promote collagen deposition in a specific direction. But remember, we're using agaros, not a fibrous scaffold. There are uh, pe other people who have used, you know, PGA PLA woven fibers, uh, like Farsh Pilat, for example. Um, you know, and in that case, 
the scaffold itself is giving you the structural strength that you need, but we don't know if the cells are going to produce matrix that lines up as nicely with the scaffold. Yeah. <laughs> Again, a lot of stuff that remain to be done. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so we have another question from Rafael Lesage, and she asks, uh, have you investigated further the missing component in the computational model to explain the quantitative results, the number of channels versus the medium? If yes, can you comment on how you verified computationally the hypothesis about your TGF beta? So the TGF beta um, uh, hypothesis is only supported by the experimental data, right? So the experimental data, there's more data that I didn't share with you. So the TGF beta, we showed that it binds preferentially near the, you know, the closer you are to the path surface, right? So that's shown experimentally. And the histology shows that the GAG content is highest where there's more TGF beta that's there. So we don't need the computational model to verify this. But if we want to simulate the large tissue construct with the computational model, we would need to know how this bound TGF beta has an effect on cell synthesis um, after two weeks. And so we need to do a lot more characterization of how the synthesis rate you know, suddenly increases after two weeks. So the model would be useful at that point, but you have to remember the model is a tool. It was a tool towards figuring out how can we make large constructs. And in the end, we were able to answer that question from experiments. So the model was very helpful in the beginning. It made us realize we didn't have enough glucose and enough nutrients in the bath, so we had to increase the amount of media. But later on, we didn't need the model to get the final answer. We were able to get the answers we needed from experiments. The other proof that TGF beta binding is explains the reason. So the same former student, Michael Albro, showed that TGF beta has an active form and a latent form. And its latent form is a larger ma macromolecule. It turns out that the latent form doesn't bind as much to cartilage as the active form. So when he cultured constructs in latent, latent TGF beta, he got much more uniform construct uh, matrix synthesis because the latent TGF beta would diffuse much deeper into the construct and it would activate you know, based on cues when it would bind to cell receptors, and then the cells would produce the matrix. So that was the final proof that I didn't present here because that was Mike's study, and I decided that, you know, uh, <laughs> it was too much to present. Yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, thank you for the answer as well. Uh, so we have a more implementation question uh, from Tim Ricken saying that, asking well was the numerical simulations always stable and how long does the simulation last uh the numerical simulations um once once you inform the simulation with experimental data like the glucose consumption rate and the matrix synthesis rates came from experimental data when you put those numbers in then you you know the simulations did not produce anything crazy and they converge nicely we also had to use the Tim Ricken and I published a paper on multi-generational growth. So uh, because we wanted to take into account that the sample, the construct is swelling by a factor of nine, right? The swelling ratio is ninefold. So the collagen that's deposited in the first week is in a different reference configuration than the collagen that's deposited in on day 105, right? So we actually ran our simulations by taking new generations of collagen every day for 105 days. So we had to create these input files that allowed for 105 generations of collagen being deposited. Uh, those models ran really well, and we ran them on relatively small sized, you know, uh, elements. We, we didn't run them on like a 40 millimeter diameter construct. They, they were on the three millimeter diameter construct. And the uh, simulations would run in about a half hour to an hour. Those were very well behaved simulations. Yeah, I hope that answers the question beautifully. Uh, we have another question from Alejandro asking, uh, 
have you got already any intuition on why human tissue shows less growth or this plateauing effect as compared to bovine tissue? Uh, no, uh, the, the short answer is no. I don't have a simple explanation. I think the answer is probably at the biological level. It's something that's coded in the DNA and therefore not being a molecular biologist, I don't have an explanation for it. I, uh, so Clark Hung and I, and those of us who work in cartilage tissue engineering who have a background in biomedical engineering, we face the situation. There are often things that we discover during our experiments that perhaps are gonna be fascinating from a molecular biology perspective. If I were a molecular biologist and I had the tools to explore this, for example, why taking away TGF-beta after two weeks increases the synthesis rate of GAGs after two weeks? Biologically, when I asked this question to cartilage biologists that I would meet at conferences, they were puzzled by this concept. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm an engineer who has a goal. Uh, my goal is to grow constructs that are as good as the native tissue in a reasonable amount of time and, you know, so that we can use them in uh, implantation. As long as I can reach that goal, I don't need to necessarily explain the phenomena every step of the way. You could think of it as, you know, when the, the Wright brothers figured out how to fly a plane, they haven't figured out all the fluid mechanics yet. It took decades of research later on to, to optimize the design of planes. It was very helpful to figure out the fundamentals to make things better. But so I kind of feel like we're at that stage. If we got something to work, we move on to the next challenge. That's the way I look at it. So if human cells don't work after 28 days, then I'll try to grow the constructs in 28 days. That would be my goal. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's perfectly how an engineer would view that problem. Uh, I, I had a sort of a follow up to this uh, discussion or this question that uh, given that now there is more stress also on combining the mechanics uh, or, or the, uh, the different component based models together with uh, uh, systems biology based approaches. So I would like to hear your opinion on, on how is this field going to develop and how necessary it is to sort of combine the, the intracellular biochemical processes together with the mechanics and the, and the transport of the solutes in the system, more in the cellular level? So um, that's an interesting question. You could say, let's say that we were able to grow cartilage from human cells perfectly well. And we were, every time we grew cartilage constructs that way, surgeons would immediately order them from the tissue bank. The tissue bank would say, we ran out. We don't have enough cells, human cells, to grow cartilage in the shape that you want. Let's say we were at that point, then I would say, okay, then a systems biology approach for maybe induced through potential stem cells, you know, who knows, maybe that's what we need to do so that we find sources of cells to grow cartilage human cartilage in the shape that we want. So if we reach that point, I would say it makes a lot of sense. But we haven't reached that point. And it's an interesting question. The question is, even if today we were successful in growing cartilage as good as the native tissue, do we think that surgeons will rush and order it? So when we started our studies in the late 1990s, uh, we assumed that surgeons would love that opportunity. We, we asked the surgeons around us, they were like, sure, why not? Of course, if you can grow cartilage in the shape that I want, I would want to use it. But then something interesting happened about 10 years ago. Tissue banks were able to start preserve native cartilage and bone, osteochondral allografts, in the tissue bank. And surgeons were able to order a knee condyle or a knee patella or a tibial plateau, and then they could actually transplant it. So you would think that since you have the native tissue, it's as good as anything you can make, it's already attached to the bone. Why aren't surgeons rushing to use it to treat arthritis? Because that would justify why we're putting in so much effort in tissue engineering. The answer is, it's still a niche application. The surgeons are not using allografts as the standard treatment for an arthritic knee. They're using it when so much of the joint has to be removed. 
in general, due to some cancer, bone cancer or cartilage cancer, you know, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, you have to cut out a big chunk of the tissue and there's just no way to replace it with just a metal and plastic equivalent, then the surgeons will use the allografts. A few surgeons who are very, uh, you know, uh, avant-garde surgeons will go to a tissue bank and use allografts for treating arthritis, but only a few. And those surgeons go out and they try to uh, convince their colleagues that this is a great method, but they haven't convinced the larger community. Why? Because there isn't the same history of success with allografts as we have with total joint replacements. Total joint replacements have been around for such a long time. You know that they will work for 20 years or longer. The issue is how well, how experienced is the surgeon in uh, implanting that uh, total joint replacement. So that means that it's not so clear to me today, now that allografts are available since about 10 years ago, it's not so clear to me today that surgeons are dying and waiting for us tissue engineers to grow cartilage uh, that they want. <laughs> Certainly not for the knee, the hip, or the shoulder for which total joint replacements exist. So what you have to ask yourself is, what do the surgeons need, which is not currently being met by existing uh, products? And the answer is, there are no successful total joint replacements for some of the joints in the body, for example, the thumb joint. There are no total joint replacements that are successful. In Europe, there are some that are used, but in the United States, there is no total joint replacements used for the thumb. And so if you could show that you could grow cartilage in the shape of a thumb, then perhaps the surgeons who do thumb replacements will be very excited to have that opportunity. So you need to find the open needs. It, it becomes a, a, a business proposition. Once you reach this point in your research, you can no longer think as a fundamental basic scientist. You need to look at it as also a business venture, as clients, customers, you know, your customers are the surgeons. What do they need? Okay. My that was a very long answer, but that's that's why I'm saying it's not clear to me that we need to jump to systems biology yet. We need to know, do the surgeons really want this? <laughs> but that was quite insightful from the perspective of uh, of tissue engineers, especially as because our end product is always to be helping the surgeons out with, and definitely that, that need is what motivates our research in a way. So thank you for that insightful answer. So I'll just have a last question to end today's discussion and that question is more a perspective question again. Uh, and, the, and the question is from Kerem and he asks, uh, where do you see the future of tissue biomechanics in general? Mm. So tissue biomechanics in general is a very broad question. So I have spent most of my time in cartilage mechanics and I have seen the field of cartilage mechanics mature during my career. When I started out, my advisor was a pioneer. He had made very significant advances but during the first 10 years of my research, cartilage mechanics was still a very exciting field, a lot of competition, a lot of different groups trying to push new interpretations to understand structure, function, relationships, and cartilage. I would say that topic is mostly closed at the level of understanding structure, function, relationships. We kind of have a very good understanding. So what's the next step? Uh, damage mechanics, fatigue, failure of tissues, which, you know, it's not just cartilage, obviously a heart valve or a vascular replacement or, a, you know, normal vasculature, you know, if you have an aneurysm, people who are interested in aneurysm ruptures in vascular tissue mechanics want to understand damage mechanics, fatigue mechanics, right? Those are the open questions in mechanics today. The mechanisms of failure, now that we understand the normal structure function relationships, we also have a very good understanding of the tissue composition and ultrastructure, even in disease. But what we're not able to do is non-invasively determine the risk of failure of, let's say, an aneurysm. Or is it time to replace this cartilage or does it still have enough life? How long, how much longer? Let's say a surgeon does an arthroscopy, looks at the knee joint. Right now, they use a probe to touch the cartilage and they say, this looks, looks good to me, this looks bad. But you know, if they touch a thin region, then they're gonna feel the bone underneath. It may feel 
stiff, but that's because you're feeling the bone underneath. They might, you know, feel a thick region and say, well, this looks soft, but that could just be because it's thicker cartilage, you know. So what I'm saying is the ability to understand the failure risk from the tissue composition, because you can assess the composition non-invasively from imaging. It's not easy, but it's doable. And composition may correlate with mechanical properties, but that correlation may not be unique. But if you find a strong correlation in your experiments, then you can use that clinically to take an image from which you assay the composition and then you predict the failure risk. That would be amazing. What if it turns out there's no correlation? Like in cartilage, I told you, in healthy cartilage, there's no correlation between composition and properties. Then you need to find other ways. Those are the challenges that remain open in tissue biomechanics. Understanding how the tissue might fail non-invasively <laughs> for <laughs> clinical purposes. Thank you once again for this insightful answer. And I think uh, I would like to close the session with, with these beautiful insights from Professor Tatian. Uh, and I would again like to thank Professor Tatian for agreeing to give this talk and, and, and all the beautiful discussions that we have. I would also like to thank the attendees for their nice questions and, and being a part of this event. So that's all from our side. We would see you again in, in the next VPH webinar sometime soon. Thank you very much, Professor Rotation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.